So first up is Professor Carl Swanson and Curtis Tucker. If you would join me up front. So this has been a segment we've had three years running and it's been really wildly popular because you can see the diverse array of ways you can use a legal career or not use a legal career. But um, we leave you wanting, they're about 15 to 20 minute segments and everyone says, I would love to have heard them for an hour. So we're looking <laughs> forward to it. Take us away, all right, and welcome Curtis. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Professor Tara Johnson, and this is the first time I've been able to sit down at the front of this classroom ever. <laughs> so that's very exciting. Um, it's even more exciting to be able to uh, have a conversation with Kurt Pepper this morning. But I want to say one more thing that I always say when I'm standing up in front of um, our wonderful, wonderful students, which is especially the one else I get to teach them in the fall when they just arrive. And I say the most marvelous thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to become an alum of Northeastern <laughs> University of Boston. And you are going to join this marvelous community, which is going to entertain you, support you, uplift you for the rest of your careers. Uh, it's really exciting to see um, what my students are entering into. So thank you all for coming today. So, Kurt, yes. I have to ask you this. Kurt is a conductor and a composer, and is the director of First Opera in St. Augustine, Florida, which is the third opera company that he has been a director of. So the question that comes to my mind is, do you have this job because you are a lawyer or in spite of the fact <laughs> that you are a lawyer? Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, it's, I'm delighted to be here uh, from Florida, in fact. Um, in, in, maybe both. Uh, a little bit. Um, I, so I grew up in a musical family. My dad was a high school band director. I've been around music forever. I think I was singing uh, at the same time I could walk. And so I've been around music just an awful long time. And I got a couple of degrees in music. So I was definitely a musician to start. And then life happened. And I moved to California. And then I moved to Massachusetts. And, you know, I started to think about some other other roots because I had a little period of time after graduate school in music. Uh, that I now lovingly refer to as my starving artist years. Uh, that, that was the San Francisco period, uh, which was great. But um, And so I was moving cross country to Boston for personal reasons. And by the time I got from one coast to the other, I just decided, you know, maybe there's another path for me. And um, I did some research. I wanted to be in a professional field. I found law really intriguing. Um, I'm not sure we have time to go into all of them, but there were some other events that happened that kind of led me into that path and introduced me to some, some legal issues. And so um, by the time I got to Boston, I decided I wanted to go to law school. And, and so here I am, and law school has been um, a very important part of my career as an opera administrator, opera producer, as an arts administrator. Um, it's opened doors for me. It's been very useful in the, in the practice of what I do. Not maybe so much as when I'm standing on the podium conducting or if I'm singing or if I'm composing, but certainly in the administration of the opera companies that I've run. And when I came out of law school, my first job was as managing director of a small opera company, two really, Ohio and Indiana. And there were lots of, uh, lots of issues that would come up that my law training was very useful for. Well, I want to take you back to that Jack Kerouac moment when you're driving to California <laughs> right. to the East Coast and you have this revelation, maybe it's more St. Paul on the road to Damascus, where you realize you need to go to law school. Um, because I think you shared that uh, you were having some particular experiences in California in those starving artist uh, days in which you founded your own company. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So I was the director of music at church when I was in, in California, and I was putting on a production of Amal and the Night Visitors, so a holiday Christmas opera, uh, a community production. And I had another friend and colleague. We wanted to do something else along with that. And we decided, well, we'll do Giancarlo Minotti's The Telephone. If you know, it's a little 20-minute uh, opera. And the two of us performed it and produced it. And we enjoyed that so much that we thought we should do more of that. Why don't we start a chamber opera company? And so we did. We started the California Chamber Opera Theater, which operated for, for a little while. Well, there were, we were the two of us. We recruited three friends 
all singers and musicians. So we had a group of five that was essentially the initial board of directors. All of us knew how to sing, all of us knew how to perform, all of us knew how to put on a concert. None of us knew the first thing about setting up an orga a nonprofit organization, let alone running. And so uh, I think it just so happened to be, and maybe it's just my, my temperament, you know, if I don't know how to do something, I just like to go try and figure it out. So of the five of us, I was the one that decided to do a little research and, you know, figure out what it meant to be a nonprofit and how you go about founding that and how do you operate it. And, and so that really laid a lot of the groundwork. Uh, I don't know that I knew much about it at that point, but uh, at that point, you know, I was the one in the group that did that. And that was certainly a key factor in thinking about going to law school, you know, a few years after that. Well, talk to us a little bit about your um, Northeastern time, because if you're heading out to the East Coast and you have this revelation that you want to go to law school, um, it takes a special sort of person to decide that you're going to end up at Northeastern School of Law, right? <laughs> well, I, well I, I guess so. Uh, the thing that really attracted me most to Northeastern was a co-op program. Um, I had a bachelor's degree. I had a master's degree. I had been out of school for three years. And um, so, you know, not old, certainly uh, by that point, but, uh, you know, jumping back into the academic environment, I just thought the opportunity to get out and learn and study in the field through the co-op program uh, was just fantastic and really suited what I was interested in then. Um, and, and in fact, I look back at, at those times and, and those four co-ops that I did uh, that were all around the country were, were wonderful parts of my education here. And that's really what attracted me to Northeast. Well, let's talk about that because um, uh, I have plenty of students who come to law school with a deep love for music, deep experience for music, and um, they're always interested in hearing how you connect that to a career. So I'm wondering what kinds of co-ops you did in law school. What were you thinking about? What did you explore? Well, when I was in law school, I mean, I came to law school um, knowing that arts administration was a potential and logical path for me, but I also came to law school as a 1L, uh, you know, studying contracts towards property, and so, and so I wasn't thinking, so I had a little bit of a break from music and the arts, frankly, uh, and so I wasn't entirely sure. I thought I might, you know, practice law when, when I finished, so my co-ops, let's see, um, what was the first one? I could get him in, get him in. <laughs> the clerk for Justice Morris at the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, I then went to the city and county attorney's office in San Francisco. So I drove cross country uh, and, and drove back for that, for that co-op. Um, I, my third one, I think it was, uh, was with Zachary Schuster, a small kind of startup literary agency here in Boston, um, who's one of the partners had been a musician that came to Northeastern and, and got his law degree. Um, and they shared offices with a, uh, um, uh, a location scouting firm for film. So again, I had, access and, and sort of exposure to a lot of artistic issues there. And then the last one was with Palmer Dodge, which at one point was a big firm here in Boston. So there was a nice wide variety to those. So after you had those experiences, we all know, of course, that today Kirk is an opera company director, but what were you thinking when you graduated? What was that job search like? Where did you end up um, post-grad? Um, so I went directly from Northeastern to my first full-time job in opera administration, um, but I had interviews of both in the legal field and in arts, in the arts administration field. I was looking at both. Um, I, had a, I had an interview at a large firm in the city that I grew up in, and I thought I was going to get that job offer. I ultimately didn't, but it was for a position in ERISA. Uh, well, I'm really thankful I didn't get that. Uh, sit and read contracts, at, you know, um, or go produce opera. Uh, for me, that's a kind of an easy choice. Um, so, but I was looking at both. I responded to an ad in a in a trade publication for arts jobs and arts administration uh, for two small little companies, Sorg Opera in Middletown, Ohio, Whitewater Opera in Richmond, Indiana. They were separate companies, separate boards of directors, but shared their their senior leadership. Um, and I went in for what was a newly created position. I went out and interviewed for a position of business manager. And by the time I got there, they were calling me managing director. So I had a, got a promotion before I got there. And uh, the, 
the company founder was the artistic director and my job frankly was whatever he didn't want to do he had founded these companies run it a long time and i became his his right hand but i learned an awful lot from him his last name was combo piano how's that for a someone running an opera company musician <laughs> And um, and then he retired and moved to Florida and the two positions were recombined. I became the general and artistic director of that company and then uh, went on to do that at two more companies after that where I'm still doing it. And were you sort of your own GC or did you hire out the legal work for those companies? Oh, uh, that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that in 25 plus years, of doing this, um, I have never found myself in a courtroom um, <laughs> related, related to any of my work with the, with the opera company. Um, one of the things about, you know, I think I said that it, law school opened doors for me, and really all of these positions it did. All of these positions I got hired for were hired directly by the boards of directors. They were all small companies, uh, but, you know, they're run by a, a board of directors, and you know, some positions, the opera company are hired by the general director, uh, many of the companies, in fact, um, and certainly all, all the artistic, but as well as a lot of the administrative, but the position, all of the positions I've had have been hired directly by the boards of directors, and the people who sit on those boards of directors, by and large, love opera, that's why they're there, they love the art form and the mission, and many of them know very little about it, or how it's made, or what's created, um, so they don't necessarily know that much about my musical training, but when I can go interview with them, who's on those boards, it's all business and professional people primarily. And, and when coming out of law school, that meant something to them. So I feel like all of the jobs that I've really ever had as an opera administrator have come about because, in large part, because of that law degree. I mean, at least initially, because boards understand that. And we can have conversations about that. And I could speak to them on their terms, uh, not just on musical terms. And so those things are really useful. I think I got away from the original question. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we've been talking about the law in your music. Yeah. And I'm going to switch to sort of the music in your law. So I'm, I'm asking you to cast your mind back. And um, are there times during your student days at Northeastern that you shared your musical talents with the community? I assume that you all had the No Talent Show when you were on a student, so you were a proud continuum? No. No? no. no? Well, we have one okay. now. <laughs> that raises money for uh, nonprofit co-ops. And it's an opportunity for both the talented and the talent last among the uh, community to share. So Kurt obviously walked in here with some talent, so I'm wondering if he shares. Yeah. Uh, so, well, like I said, I took a little bit of a break from music when I came to law school, but yes, we had a talent show, and I did perform on that talent show. Um, and that's always, for me, been a wonderful icebreaker. Because I came to, you know, I, came, I, I just moved to Massachusetts. I didn't really know anybody. I came, I performed on the talent show. Um, and then all of a sudden I could go out and people saw me perform. And so it's very easy for them to come up and feel like they know me. Um, and so that, that's always been a wonderful icebreaker. So yes, I sang a little piece. It was a silly comic thing. I don't even know if I remember it now. Uh, but I sang on that talent show. Uh, first year law, not a lot of time for singing, et cetera. But, <laughs> Second and third year, I did. I sang in a paid choir at the first and second church here in Boston, and I was their assistant director. The conductor had to, to leave. Um, I did that. I sang a production of the Pirates of Penzance out in Foxborough. Uh, I sang Frederick, and I remember the review uh, that came out in the paper said something about um, Curtis Tucker saying, Frederick, go, go, law school at Northeastern. Um, if he says good in the courtroom as he is on stage, you know, people better look out or something. <laughs> so a little bit, yes. I, well, the one other I have to say, I took a corporate finance class uh, while I was here, and we had a group assignment, and uh, we were we had to do a group presentation on a on a merger, and mine was Bay Bank and Bank of Boston back in the twenty five years ago, and we had a little group and. Um, you know, a presentation with a PowerPoint and everybody presenting graphs and all of that is all interesting and, and well and good. But uh, I just always have come from an artistic background. So I wrote a play. Uh, I, I wrote a play about a blind date in which Bank of Boston and Bay Bank met um, and, and ended up merging. <laughs> And, and the professor said in uh, the, all the years of doing that class that no one had ever done that before. So I, 
I would certainly welcome anybody who wants to do a play in my Latin class for their final or <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I also want to ask you, um, so I, I told you, Kurt is artistic director, he's a lawyer, he runs the whole opera company, but he's also a conductor and a composer, and one of the operas, one of the several operas he's written, is called The Trial of B.B. Wolf. And this is not B.B. as in B.B. King, this is B.B. as in Big Bad, right? This is a retelling of the Red Wedding story through the law, through the courtroom. So I'm, I'm really interested, um, Kurt, about that experience and how your, your legal hat played into that um, opera, which you, which you put on many times in the last couple of years, right? I, I have. We've done it several times. In fact, it, this past January, it was performed at the National Conference of the National Opera Association, which was which was kind of fun. So this, uh, when I was at Opera Saratoga, late, it used to be Lake George Opera in upstate New York, we did an education program in the winter. We brought singers to town, put on a little children's opera or family opera, and then toured it to elementary schools. We performed for 30,000 kids a year. And I did a few of those. There were some existing pieces. And a colleague of mine, after a few years, finally said, you know what? I think we could write one of these that might be just as good or, or, or better. And so my colleague, Nelson Sheely, uh, it was the librettist and I was the composer. So I really did the music and, and he did the text. So he initially laid a lot of this out, but I will say in reviewing the text in order to set it to music, you know, there are plenty of legal cons. To, it's a courtroom setting. So uh, there were pl plenty of legal issues and comments. And so we did have to tweak the language a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not sure it would really hold up under, you know, <laughs> faculty <laughs> scrutiny uh, here. But, um, you know, I like to think that at least, you know, gets the legal presentation correct uh, in this. And uh, Big Bad is, in fact, um, you know, there are two, two cases against him, criminal cases. Uh, one gets dismissed for silly operatic artistic reasons, and uh, and then the other one is uh, a, a case against him for first degree murder for Little Red's grandmother, and you know, and, and the case of what uh, my colleague and I do a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan. We like Gilbert and Sullivan. There's always a little twist at the end. So in our version, Little Red is definitely a villain. Uh, <laughs> but we actually for that uh, there was a there was a musical. 30 years ago, maybe called The Mystery of Edwin Brood, played on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that, when, and it's one of the first productions I saw on Broadway. And when you go, the action goes to a certain point, based on a Dickens novel, right? And so it goes to a certain point, um, and then the audience actually votes on who did it. <laughs> and, and depending on, they, they, they come out into the crowd, they, you know, various people take their count, they take it backstage, they add it up, and they determine a villain and something else I don't even remember. Um, and the audience doesn't know who won until afterwards, and then they post the results in the lobby. But the cast has to be ready for these slightly different endings. Who's going to come out and you know, sing the song about how they did this murder or why they did this murder is based on audience input. So in a much smaller way, we did this with the trial of B.B. Wolf. We have a little lottery at the beginning with, with, that with everybody coming in and actually choose a 12 person jury from the audience, invite them up to sit in their seats on stage. And then after B.B. Um, Wolf and Little Red have presented their versions of the story, the, the jury actually votes on whether he's guilty or not. And then that affects the ending of the piece a little bit. Although, like I say, through operetta twist, Little Red is always guilty. <laughs> so if you have young people in your life that you want to inspire to be either a lawyer or artistic director, or perhaps both at the same time, keep your eyes out for the trial of B.B. King coming to a city <laughs> now. <laughs> We're in our, our last um, few minutes, and um, uh, I think the final question is is really obvious here. If you can step back and think, right, we've been through these COVID years, and those have been particularly hard in the arts world because uh, live performance pink was stopped for a period of time. And Kurt has really successfully brought his company in St. Augustine through those last few years. They're back to in-person performances, so congratulations for surviving that. And my final question is, what is your next act? <laughs> uh, my next act, uh, you know, I have, I've always loved composing and I've never done as much of it as I would like. I've written three operas, I've written some other, you know, smaller pieces, 
Um, and I, I would like to think that I'm moving into a period when I can do that. See, the thing is, I've been, you know, maybe a lawyer. I, was <coughs> I, I, I passed the bar. I was licensed in Ohio. When I moved to New York, I'm an NA. So, but, you know, maybe a lawyer. Uh, I'm a producer, artistic director, conductor, singer, teacher. Uh, I've done all these things. Uh, composing and writing is really the, the thing that I'd like to do. Uh, the most, I think. But just before my time completely runs out, the one thing that I want to say that I realized that I haven't, that was really valuable to me and going back to why did I come to law school or what did I get out of law school? How did law school help my career? Um, I believe the study of law and particularly the study of law at Northeastern is great education. It's great education for anything. And people come to this law school from all different fields. We heard the dean say how many different majors were represented and people come out of this law school and go out into every field, literally. Opera, if opera is one of them, they, they go out into every field and can have real impact um, uh, in society, in the arts, in business, in, in every field. And that was really important. And the, one of the things that I've been very successful at as an opera administrator, opera administrator the name of the game now, in just about anything is fundraising, right? Fundraising. And so fundraising is super important in the arts. And I became a pretty darn good grant writer, if I, if I do say so, by coming to law school, going through legal practice, first year, learning how to research, how to write uh, um, an objective memo, how to write a persuasive brief, which is really a lot of what a grant is like. And I've had good success with grant writing. And uh, I mean, there's lots of other skills, public speaking and understanding of contracts and labor issues and, and all of those things. Uh, but grant writing in particular, I felt like I became a much better thinker, a much better writer because of my experience at Northeastern University School of Law. Well, thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you for starting us off right. We're going to do a really quick switch in between each one. Next up, we have Adrian Dudley, former corporate of Northeastern. With Dudley Rich, she's class of 72. She'll be joined by former Dean and Professor Jeremy Paul. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you to Cara and Curtis. That was really fun. So, so we have a tough act to follow, but I sure but I know you're more, more than up there. Uh, so for any of you who have now already met me, I'm Jeremy Paul. It's great to see many, many of you. Uh, back again. Uh, I'm sure you're all wondering, you know, what happens to former dean? And the answer is, we're still just all trying to keep me all happy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. it. Anyway, Adrian, it's great to have you here. We really appreciate your uh, coming back. Uh, and, and you have a fascinating story. Uh, you founded not only one, two, but in, in a triumph of hope over experience, three law firms. Uh, and the third one has uh, certainly been a wonderful success. Uh, you uh, involved in all sorts of legal matters, business, labor. Uh, you sit on many boards, the Rotary Club, the president of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you have twins, three grandchildren, uh, and you do all that while living in the Virgin Islands. Uh, so, for God's sakes, tell us, how did you get all that done? <laughs> and, and a little bit about your story. Well, it was all fun. My best experience in life was coming to Northeastern Law School. I got to tell you. It wasn't as complex and wonderful and fancy like this, but we were some really hard working innovators and learners because the school was on a committee when we came, but we were so devoted and committed to the idea of cooperative education. It certainly worked for me. I was a poor kid who grew up in housing projects and all I ever did was work. And so the idea that I could come to law school and work meant that I would learn how to do something at which I could really make money. I said, wow, this is tremendous. And of course, getting a scholarship didn't hurt because I didn't have a dime. But I love, love Northeastern. From Northeastern, I got the idea, because of Professor Bernstein's labor class, that I was cut out to be a labor lawyer. 
and employment, organizational behavior, and all kinds of, and all aspects of that field have been my favorite activity in law. I also do other things. I do a lot of environmental law because living in the Virgin Islands, our environment is everything. So doing environmental law obviously is the, one of the most important things that I do. Um, and it's it's gorgeous, please, all of you, you're invited. <laughs> Don't hesitate. I live on St. Thomas. I live in a place that has a view of town and the water, and my office is on the waterfront. When I get bored, I look, I never get bored. I <laughs> There's always something to do, but I can look out of the mahogany glass, of the mahogany framed glass windows and the doors of my office, because it's in a warehouse, out on the water, the cruise ships, the sailboats. So if I'm in a particularly difficult situation, and we have some really difficult situations, particularly with developers and the coastline, um, I can look out and say, it's all worth it. I moved there in 1975 after a brief stint with the federal government, like everybody else. Um, and I could not work for a year. I had to do something. So I was then married to a very wealthy local man and his mother, my mother-in-law, took me around and I learned charity work. I raised money and I took things like refrigerators and stoves and washing machines to people who needed them. I learned to know everyone in the territory that way. But more importantly, I learned to know politicians. And I learned how to lobby politicians. And I think the most fun and fascinating thing that I do now is lobby our local legislature, as well as the federal House of Representatives and senators who come to the Virgin Islands, because of course, if we didn't have federal money, we couldn't survive. And we have a lot of disasters and we get a lot of money as a result of that. What I did with my children, well, I adopted twins with my then husband, they're fantastic. I have four grandchildren. I had three, but I have a new one. Oh, <laughs> I have a brand new one, my darling Zuri. And she is just the light of my life, as they all are. And as you can see, I light up like a Christmas tree when I think about my grandchildren. <laughs> it was hard getting adjusted as an American Black to a place where if you weren't born there, if you were not native West Indian, you were not welcome. But by dint of hard work and hanging out and getting to know everybody, I survived. The most, um, I think one of the most interesting things about living in the Virgin Islands is that it's extremely cosmopolitan. We have everything from Arabs to Zulus living. And so, and everyone speaks languages. I'm just learning to speak Spanish. But everyone around me speaks fluent other languages. So we have an office in Puerto Rico with my partner who works with our clients who are headquartered there. And we just created an office on St. Croix, the other major business island, so that um, we can serve our clients who have business on St. Croix. And there's a huge amount of litigation. I don't litigate anymore. I think it's just too stressful. Um, but I do other things in the community like school volunteer, and I think that's probably my next step. I'm trying to cut back, I'm 74, it's time for me to start thinking about retiring, because I can't be on the beach all day, I'm gonna work until I'm dead at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> from, from looking at all the things you do, it seems to me as though half time for you would be like full time for most people. <laughs> I, I, so you, you, you made a lot of decisions along the way. And I'm sure one of the biggest ones was when you decided of all the things you could do, you were going to found your own thing. And that seems to have a lot of common with Kurt uh, as an entrepreneurial approach. What, what made you decide that you were willing to take a leap to have your own thing rather than just find yourself in some other That's a really good question. I was, um, I was a prosecutor um, and that for the federal and the local government. Um, and if that just I made me decide that I could litigate and speak publicly successfully. I went into partnership with my then husband. And frankly, we were extraordinarily successful almost immediately. It was amazing. We represented the phone company, the water and power company. We represented two banks. 
Um, and we represented high quality clients. There weren't as many developers then, but they came, they started to come. Well, I got tired of looking at the receptionist who my husband was involved with. So I just <laughs> I didn't know how to do anything else. So I said, okay, I'm going to offer my company. Amazingly enough, those major clients, the phone company, the water power company, the bank, one of the banks, imagine that. I don't know anything about any of this stuff except doing what I was doing. They came with me. <laughs> And within a year, I had to have a partner. And in mom, almost immediately, because I was doing everything, I, I had a real estate paralegal. I had um, a bookkeeper who's now my controller. Would you believe the people who came to work with me are still with me today? Imagine. But that's what you have. What happens when you pay really well and you give great benefits. <laughs> and we pay for everything. I believe in taking care of your people. I guess that comes from my relations background. You've got to spend money on your people and they stick with you. But anyway, so I opened my doors and people came to me and said, well, you know, you're from your litigation experience, you really ought to be a plaintiff's lawyer because it's a very litigious community. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm more of a business person. I'm more of a general person. Um, I like to think that the core of our island community needs business and it needs government agencies that operate to do what they're supposed to do, particularly with respect to our environment, the coral, everything. In fact, I'm adopting another daughter who is the same age and who grew up with my kids because her mom made me guardian when she passed away. So this young lady grew up with our family from the age of 12 and went to grad school, went to college and grad school and is a tremendous success. And now she's doing environmental work in the, in the Virgin Islands. She's amazing. She can plant seedling. She raises coral that's really hardy and then plants it in places where it will survive. It's not, I know that the problem is so great, but doing something like that is such a start and it inspires others to do the same thing. So that that bleached coral, because the water is too warm, is now beginning to come back. So when you go diving and snorkeling, you see all the gorgeous coral. And it's just, it's amazing to me. But anyway, so being an entrepreneur, I thought that I didn't know what I was doing. But it was, it was funny, within five days, I figured it out. You know, you've gotta have somebody to help you take in the money. You've got to figure out how to make sure you send bills that are very detailed, detailing everything you did and accounting for every minute. And you've got to get them out every month. If you don't bill people, they're not going to pay. <laughs> so I learned that I learned as a part of the business that that was very important. I also knew that you have to be nice. I do not like um, the voicemail. It drives me nuts. So I always have a live person answering the phone. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Dudley Rich. How may we help you? When I answer the phone, particularly if it's somebody I don't know, how may I help you today? That is really the, the best way to start a conversation because people like they're warm, they're feeling warm, they're feeling welcome. And we always say, even in our engagement letter, <clears throat> and it's very important to always have an engagement and a retainer. I get my money up front. <laughs> I get a big retainer, and then I know, well, whatever happens when that starts to run out, okay, hello. <laughs> we need more money. <laughs> but you know, you just have to do it. And I personally take those, I personally do that work. I do the receiver. And I am proud to say that right now, the longest receivable our firm has is 90 days out. Can you imagine? <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> and we're in the big leagues now. And I'm really proud of that. We just, have, we just keep adding people. And it's wonderful. I hope you're saying co-op students. Oh, we did. We hired a co-op student. And in fact, I offered a co-op job yesterday. I met 
a 1L and I said, next year, when you're a 2L, you've got to apply to me in the Virgin Islands. So I gave him my information. So that's he was a really cool kid. So I was sure we were all delighted to hear when you said that these were your best experience. Oh, ever. yes. So are there any lessons or experiences you can remember from law school that now inform the way you explain your business? Uh, the Tom O'Toole, towards professor. Um, um, uh, Berman, <laughs> I learned from him how not to do this. <laughs> that is funny, this funny story. It's funny now, it wasn't funny then. <laughs> Professor Berman, our tax lawyer, decided to give us a final exam in which the, the idea was to determine what, how and whether the earnings and activities of a prostitute <laughs> were to be taxed. And it got into what I thought was an unacceptable detail about this situation, because I felt that, you know, this is a sex worker. We knew that even at that time, even though we didn't call them sex workers, we knew that these were women who were earning their living, doing what they knew how to do, and that's all they knew how to do. So there was a person in our class, and I'm sorry to say she can't be with us today, um, named Martha. And Martha said, all the women are going on strike. And she just looked around and she said, okay, let's go. We got up and we walked out. Can you believe that? <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things I learned um, was to have an affectionate group of professors. Steve Stubern and I, and one of my classmates, Richie Edberg, who was my dearest friend, was we were so close, along with Mark Shire and some others, and then of course George, George, George Platt, let me tell you. He was the star of our class. I never thought he'd come to much. And now he's the richest guy in South Carolina. <laughs> he is a doll. We worked together on the reunion committee with Mark, and wow, I can't believe we raised 250000 for the class of 72. <laughs> we had other professors who were just amazing. Dan Gehelver, what a guy. Oh, he's such a sweetie. He was our friend. All the professors, I mean, we all kind of, there were only 44 people in our class. And some of those kind of fell by the wayside. So by the time we graduated, maybe, I don't know, 38, 39, and all of our professors, I mean, we were always together. We were friends. We ate together. We had drinks together. We hung out together. There was an experience like I, never had and I learned. I learned a lot. I didn't learn about corporate finance except by experience. But let me tell you, that experience gave, I think, all of us the self-confidence to move ahead and do things like start your own business. So all of us are dealing with young people now in one way or another, whether you're in the classroom or mentoring uh, young people out of the world. Are there tips that you might provide Books you think people should read, um, that lesson learned that could help people to get to where you got. Well, one lesson learned is I read everything all the time. I read The Economist, I read The New Yorker. One of my favorite books of the moment is Premonition by Michael Lewis. Those of you who know Michael Lewis know he could, he could write about the history of water trucks and it would be fascinating. Um, that's he's a great mining trucker. Right now, I'm reading a book by um, Osnos, who uh, it's called Wild. It's utterly amazing. It's the history of how we got where we are today and how it's not new and how uh, President Trump, former President Trump, um, just rode the wave that already existed. Um, and where, where it all started. Uh, that is something, that's a book I, I recommend to all of you. Um, another book that I think, well, let me leave the books for a minute because I'm sure you're all reading. With respect to young people, um, I have 
no one close to my age working with me. My partner, Carol Rich, is 65. That's, we're the old people. But everyone else in the office, well, not so much the staff, they're all in their 50s, but they've been with me so long. But one of the things that we know about young people is because we hire them and train them. And um, they become um, they become stars in their own right. And that's what you want. You want a team around you that's at least as intelligent as the most intelligent person you have already met. But you don't want them to be talking like they're the smartest person in the room. <laughs> the, but the work I do actually, mentoring and working in schools is, I think, the more important. Um, I recruit for Northeastern for the undergrad and for the law school. And right now I have a couple of stars, a young women with whom I'm working, but I work with boys too. Um, and you have to give them time. The most important thing I think all of us can and should do is work with young people. As young as they, you can start in the third grade or you can start in high school, but mentor someone who needs you. It is the most rewarding thing that you can do because when you tell a young girl, it's a girl, I started as a Girl Scout leader. When you tell a young girl you can be anything you want to be, despite your circumstances, you end up with an OBGYN who walks down the street and says, Hey, <laughs> I'm so happy you helped me so much. But today, I'm, I'm working on one young woman who's in high school, who's at the top of her class, who has great SAT scores, who plays a musical instrument, speaks fluent Spanish, and is an athlete. I am trying to get her to come to Northeastern undergrad, and I think I won't have any problem at all. That's great. <laughs> so, so one last thing, along the way you managed to have your Portrait painted by oh, the yeah. illustrious artist. Yeah, that's tell us a little bit about that. Cool story. Yeah. <laughs> I left home at 13. I couldn't take it anymore. I was old as the date, and all I was was the washer. So I moved, and my family was moving, and I was tired of moving. I wanted to finish high school in one place. Well, that one place was Stockbridge, Massachusetts, uh -huh. Allison's Restaurant. Place. <laughs> it wasn't there then, but it was there shortly after I left. And needless to say, I was the only black person in the entire community. But you know something? It didn't really matter very much. So I lived with this family. I was their housekeeper and I was their babysitter. And, but I didn't make any money. I did that from my room board. Across the street from where I lived was this wonderful guy. He was kind of older, a little stupid. His wife was one of those, you know, welcoming grandmothers that you see in ads and well, old ads. Anyway, so I went over there and he asked me to babysit his grandchildren because I was an expert babysitter. I knew <laughs> um, and his name was Norman Rockwell. <laughs> <laughs> Norman Rockwell, not as the great painter in the world, but just as a really sweet man. Anyway, he did a series of paintings of school children in what was then communist Russia, big time communist Russia. And I later visited Russia because I was so excited about what I learned from these photos and, and paintings rather. So I asked him because my family was leaving if he would do a little charcoal sketch of me on this cardboard that I had so I could give it to my family so they could take it with them. And he said, oh, no, I like your complexion. I like the color of your face. I think I'll paint your portrait in oil. He said, I can't afford that. I, I mean, I'm just a baby. Oh, no, no, I'll give it to you. <laughs> so he painted my portrait in oils. I sat for about two hours. And it was, it was an incredible experience. He painted my portrait on the back of a palette. That portrait framed, sat in my sister's closet. Yes. I was embarrassed <laughs> to say that I had a painting on myself. I mean, how self-centered, right? And so when I moved to the Virgin Islands and I'm married to this guy who has a huge ego, needless to say, we're not married. 
I left in 10 years, it was called Walter. Anyway, so it was in a closet because I, and so my sister said, do you want this? I said, yeah, yeah, of course. It's, I mean, it's a painting, let's face it. And I collect art. So I got the painting and I was going to hang it in the living room. My husband said, I don't think that's appropriate. So, uh, <laughs> so immediately after we separated, I take out the painting and I say, I'm going to get this framed by a really good framer. So I did. And I hung it on the wall. At the time, I represented the Daily News, the local newspaper, which was owned by the Gannett Company. I hosted the entire board, because I lived in this huge house. Uh, I hosted the entire board of the Gannett Corporation. And one of the members of the board looked at my painting and said, wow, this is most unusual. I don't think I've ever seen a painting by Norman Rockwell of a black person. And so he wrote about it, would you believe, in the Reno, Nevada newspaper. <laughs> so that's when it, this became a thing, as they say. The portrait now hangs on loan from my collection at the Norman Rockwell Museum in the Portrait Gallery. <laughs> What is the most incredible experience? And the nicest, the nicest thing about it, and it brings tears to my eyes, was I brought members of my family. A lot of them did not know about this. My grandson didn't know. My son didn't even know because he was in prep school by the time I put it up. We all went to the museum and we saw the portrait in the gallery with the lights on it. And it was so exciting. It was so marvelous. They treated me like a queen. That's incredible. Yes. And they want me to come back and be a mom. <laughs> <laughs> Your background on the islands, everything. So next up, we have the Honorable Janet von Arterton, who's a senior U.S. District Judge from the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut. And we have Professor Michael Messner, who, as we heard, is an author and has a terrific book out right now called Mosaic, Who Paid for the Bullet? So we're thrilled to have you all. And our next Perry. Thank you for coming. A few introductory remarks. First of all, I just want to thank the dean for all the things you've done, but mostly uh, uh, for mentioning the book. And from your lips to the New York Times, both of you. <laughs> Uh, and I want to make sure everyone understands that nobody, no person is essential. No person is essential except the L. <laughs> so uh, uh, I have spent more years than I would like to remember being interrogated and grilled by federal judges. So this is a unique experience this is for me. Um, and I, I, I hope I can take advantage of it. Um, but I'm going to start in a somewhat surprising way for I think many people here, um, certainly for me. Um, in writing Mosaic, I had to learn how detailed and particular an autopsy is. And in uh, looking up your record, the first thing I discovered was that you were a coroner at age 21, a rector. So two questions. One is, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> and secondly, did you do autopsies? So this tells you what you do with the time. I was a senior, I was a junior at Mount Holyoke. Um, a position for county coroner in New Jersey was going to be on the ballot. 
the uh, New Jersey Supreme Court had ruled that since coroner is a constitutional office, it needed to appear on the ballot. It was not a terribly sought after position. <laughs> and so none of the major parties had put up a nominee. So it had to be a write-in campaign. And I organized a write-in campaign using our old friend mimeograph machine <laughs> and sent out letters to former teachers, my parents' friends, anybody who I thought <clears throat> might think I was credible and do what I was asking them to do, which is write in my name on the ballot. And it worked. And lo and behold, I was coroner of Murphy County. Um, the great thing about it was, well, as I always said, I had to use commensurate with the salary paid me. Uh -huh. And the residual duties that I did have, because we had a medical exam system, oh, included auctioning off the personal effects of shipwreck victims. Mercer County does not have a big coast, but it does have the Delaware River. That's where Princeton is. Yes. Uh, and uh, standing in for the sheriff should the sheriff be unable to carry out duties. But though, sadly, I had no coroner inquests because the medical examiner took care of all the autopsies and results. Well, what was the motive behind doing it? Was it, was it playful? Was it, it did was, you think you wanted to be a doctor? What was it? I would have to say it was playful. Wow. There was also a subtle purpose, which is, I had this new boyfriend, <laughs> except he was also dating a girl at Smith. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I get the publicity that Chris Arterton was my campaign manager. He was mine. That would take care of that. And it did. <laughs> <laughs> and we had actually been married for six years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that someone saying, Hey, you want to date my uh, my friend, a really great woman I know. She's the coroner. <laughs> you know, it got on the wire services. And there was a sort of a sexist thing to it, like, oh, what's this girl doing? But it got on the wire services. And I heard from people literally all over the world who had known me. A science teacher from third grade who was in Argentina. Boyfriends who were serving in Vietnam, um, a fraternity up in New Hampshire that wanted to invite me to come and run an inquest. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I was on the Today Show with Sammy Davis Jr. and Zero Mostel. <laughs> Barbara Walters interviewed me. It was crazy. I got invited by United Pictures was just putting out the first James Bond movie to come to their opening because I was Janet Bond. And somehow there was just logic. <laughs> In any event, it was legal. But I have to tell you a funny thing. And I want to go to Rome and that's where I fly. And I knew they had rotating admissions. And the year was going along, and I hadn't heard. I thought, oh my gosh, they're filling up the class. So I called Northeast and I said, Well, what's with my, my application? He said, Well, it's incomplete because we don't have your scores at UPS. So I said, well, I need to be interviewed because I need to be compensated for this terrible thing. And Dan Gevelber interviewed me. And he, one of the first things he said was, you were a coroner. <laughs> we had a great chat. Well, uh, that reminds me that I, I hope D.B. Wolf uh, didn't get capital punishment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, you clerked for years for a New Jersey judge. Uh, and then you 
opened your own firm. No, I was yeah. the first associate at a five person firm that had recently, in the last two or three years, be, been constituted from former legal aid lawyers. So, and I was the girl. This was usually the thing, right? Well, well this is not uh, the traditional royal road to becoming a federal judge, is it? How did that happen? Well, so it's interesting because I that was a conscious choice to go away. Small, growing, socially conscious guys. I had interviewed with some big law people, and the most significant thing I remember was being interviewed at a, a very big one. And the last interview was with one of their partners, who must have been one of their rainmakers, people in the former mayor of a big city. We had a great discussion about politics. At the end, he said, you know what? We're going to make you an offer. And you know what? You're not going to take it. <laughs> so, they knew. so the long, I had 15 and a half years as a litigator. The super trial course that we had here that consumed all of the time and energy was fabulous because three weeks in the practice and six months pregnant, I did my first trial. And what was the subject? Oh, some silly little contract. It was a bench trial. It was not earth shaking. It had no appellate issues, <laughs> but I could do it. And I could do it with a call a little bit. And that was what came to tears. And so I practiced law primarily employment law, but with lots of other wonderful diversions like product liability and medical malpractice. And I I liked, I really liked the trial work, but it was too soft. Um, just as I never thought I went wanted to go to law school, I never thought I wanted to be a judge. It is fun to be a lawyer. And then I went to Europe and during the Bosnian crisis, became really aware of what happens when there is no rule of law. Went up to London to talk to the Amnesty International people to say, what do you do when there is no court? And they were describing this incredible strategy of never forgetting about people who couldn't be heard, who didn't have voices, who didn't have access. People were thinking about how keeping courts strong and on being. And so I told them I was going to do an article about it. When I got back, I said, there's, there's an opening on our bench. And it was a federal opening. I thought, wow, that is one long shot. For so did you go apply? They, they didn't have, now they have a very respectable system. This was pretty ad hoc. I got a lot of influencers who I would take to lunch and explain to them why I wanted to be a federal judge. Some of them I didn't know at all, but they were influencers who knew the senators went to, uh, they wrote letters. And then Senator Lieberman, whose turn it was to do the nomination, the, the two Democratic senators, so they were the whole thing. He had one of his um, trusted colleagues compile a list of 45 people who she, she would interview. And I'm sure my name was on the list because I wrote all these letters. And then she would pick four for the senator to interview. And I was one of those four. And my, when I was heading up for my interview, I asked my friend who was a federal judge, what's the best advice? He said, be cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> well, now, what I want to know is whether this uh, interviewer um, asked you about being a coroner. You know, I don't remember. <laughs> but I do remember is that when, after Senator Lieberman called with 
the most incredible call of my life and said, Janet, this is a really hard decision. I've thought about it. <laughs> Or just give me the and I know how important it is. I'm reflected. <laughs> so, 27 years on the federal bench, and if I ask you about cases, I mean, that's complicated. But uh, there is one case that really stands out for me because, for example, the Supreme, as you know, the Supreme Court is soon going to consider whether it wants to do away with affirmative actions. And um, you were the trial judge in one of the most important uh, affirmative action cases in recent memory. You were um, affirmed, I think, unanimously by the Second Circuit in the case. And then 5-4, it was reversed by the Supreme Court, pulling the rug out from under you. In other words, as I understand the case, you applied the then existing law, which came from the EEOC. And uh, Justice Kennedy, in his unique way, um, decided that there ought to be a different standard. And on that basis, um, you, 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 you five to four, the, Decision in the Ricci case, which reversed. This was about a new agent firefighter. Yeah, so I, I wonder how you felt about all that. Um, just another day at the office, or what? I actually went down to the argument, uh -huh. which, and I went down with my friend Drew Days, who knew. Drew Days? Yeah. A colleague of mine, I shared an office with him. Many years of the legal friends, time. wonderful man, long friend. <laughs> um, and actually, when we went back to the Supreme Court for the argument, all of the black security guards, go, oh, the general, come this way, come this way. He took us all, you know, the quick way to get to the best seats. So, oh. so I just hung out with my friend. Um, okay. I knew when they took cert, to, they took cert to reverse. Even though, as some of people have observed, there were more courts that affirmed me than reversed me. Um, it was kind of painful because it's such an important issue. And because the point of giving municipalities or employers authority <coughs> to make adjustments when the results of their employment process or their hiring process were so skewed. This is the four fifths rule that you're talking about. We're so skewed and it's only the white guys who get the firefighting promotions. And the city could have a do over as one of the justices said, um, to make it look, be at least a more even playing field. It's an important thing. However, 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 I, when I heard one of the justices who was in the majority say, it's summary judgment. <laughs> yes. So when you got back to New Haven, was there any uh, local reaction? That, um... It was a big, it was a big issue. And actually, Mr. Ritchie had been a client mm -hmm. of our firm. Years before, he has a, a learning disability. And so we have represented, not, not I, I didn't know him um, on his reasonable accommodation claim. In any event, that's what happened. But um, Justice Ginsburg did a lovely dissent. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, previously we've heard mentioned the number of the professors back in the day. Um, I'm, I'm sure Don Berman would have loved to be here to hear about his final exam. Do you have any thoughts about the professors you had here? 
Yes, of course. But well, here's the triumvirate who just made all the difference. And the Elvis DC religion crown. And those were the ones who used I probably took a little courses from them. And they're the ones who were so enthusiastic that you should learn this and enthusiastic that you should succeed. And they always had your back. And that was something that I don't think any other law school had. I think the whole sense that Northeastern University School of Law was here for the students was a really amazing proposition. Is that why you applied yes. to Northeastern? I'd only been out and been doing things for eight years. I had a, a kid, a mortgage, a house, a husband. I didn't want to go to the paper chase type place. That didn't interest me in the least. That was why I wasn't interested in law school. And then I discovered about this place. It just sounded so neat. Well, um, this is my last year of teaching, so I feel very senior. And I know that you are now a senior general, Mr. Bell. You want to tell us a little bit what that's like? Is that does that mean you get to pick what you do or um, get to take long vacations in Tahiti or <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to the Um theory, I have a 50% caseload. We're randomly assigned cases. That has not made a bit of difference in how much I work. <laughs> I do have time to do other things like run my support court, which is which I've done for 12 years before I became a senior, and which is a, a re-entry court. Can you tell us more about that? It's, it's, it is great. one of the it is perhaps the thing I this is a drug is support a, program. It's, right? a, it's for people with addictions who are either facing sentencing or coming out of prison. And who will just do the revolving door if there isn't an intervention. It's voluntary. And it is a group of people who come together with the common proposition that they're committing to themselves that enough of that and they're going to seek the support and the uh, the support and the uh, consolidation, I guess, of this commitment. And we do, this is not like a drug counseling program. We do all sorts of things that my theory is, if they're gonna go, if they're gonna stay sober, they're gonna begin to get their dopamine back. They're gonna begin to have the capacity to enjoy and benefit of all sorts of people certainly never did when they were in the height of their addictions, which were for the years. And so we've supplied them with new adventures. And last week I took them to the Yale Art Gallery. We had a brilliant time. They were, they watched how various paintings were different. They talked about what they saw. They uh, added it to each other. They did something they had never done before. And we're so excited about that. And they were brilliant. So having them, and you do it for a year, you have phases, you have different requirements, different phases. They go from being really not necessarily good at public speaking. I make them stand up and speak so that by the time they get to their sentence, they can stand up and they can really explain what has changed about them, such that the thing we hear all the time, you're never going to see me again, judge, actually seems right. And keeping people out of prison is critically important because prison ruins people. 
So last question. Uh, One of the things I've worked on over the years is, is um, the problem of the collateral consequences of a criminal conviction. And I wonder whether in running this program, you encounter, uh, you encounter your, your, uh, the uh, individuals you're working with are encountering collateral consequences. And uh, have the, well, the law in that area has changed dramatically over the years, but it's still Somewhat in, in well, it hasn't changed in the sense that if you have a federal conviction, you need a presidential pardon. Otherwise, you have a record. You've got history. And how to overcome that takes two parts. Number one is to really show, be upfront about that, but show that that's the past. It is so hard. We do all this mock employment interviews the question that is the killer is is there anything else i should know about you and they've got to get it out and, and practice it and practice it but the other is that employers are getting better and better and so there are opportunities but in the long run what you want to do is not have people have records so diversion is critical so that they don't have that, no matter how well they have rehabilitated and succeeded, and don't put them in the system to begin with. Thanks. Thank you so much. Both of you represented a hammock and I'm so pleased to be here. <laughs> You have been fantastic. Yes, we have Leo Katie and Zach, president of Agnes Scott College, uh, former keynote for women in the law. She is being interviewed by Professor Margaret on the So, I hope you're enjoying the diet in our next conversation. Thank you so much, Neil. So, I have to say, there's an enormous amount that I could say about President Zach. I could spend the entire 20 minutes talking about that, but Neil would murder me. <laughs> so, I'll just simply say that President Zach has been the president of Agnes Scott College, which is a women's college in Georgia since 2018. And Agnes Scott has been named the most innovative liberal arts college in the country for an unprecedented five years from the US News and World Report. Um, before bringing her leadership and vision to Agnes Scott College, um, she was engaged in both the private and public sector. President Zach was a partner at Miss Lemon, where she practiced international and uh, domestic finance law. She was then the general counsel and deputy director for the United States Trade and Development Agency, and then was appointed as a director under the Obama administration. She served, I don't know how she does all these things. It makes me tired of She serves on numerous nonprofit boards and boards focusing on education. She's received numerous awards for her work, including most recently a woman of influence in Atlanta. She's taught at Georgetown University and Boston University Law School. So on, I go on and on. So but I wanted to start with a question about Northeastern because she's also a proud graduate of our law school. You've had such a varied and illustrious career since leaving Northeastern. Um, and so I was wondering, did you have a sense then of where you were headed and, and what Northeastern might have prepared you for all that you've done? Well, thanks. There, thank you very much. And thanks to Neil and to Northeastern. And the answer to your question was absolutely not. <laughs> um, when I graduated from Northeastern, I had no idea of where I would be today. But one of the things that Northeastern, as you all know, does is it prepares you for change. It prepares you to take risks. I have to say, when I came to Northeastern, I was sure that I was going to be a geriatric poverty lawyer. <laughs> I did my first co-op and I worked with the elderly and I cried all the time. <laughs> I could not, if I, I was always afraid I wasn't going to succeed. I couldn't get them what they wanted. 
And personally, that took a toll. And anyone who's practicing in that area, I really, my heart and my goes out to them and I congratulate them. Um, so I had the opportunity to have you know, multiple co-ops. So I started in poverty law. I then went to see what the enemy does. And I went to Gillette. And I realized, actually, you know what? Not everything about that is the enemy. And then I had the opportunity to go to next level. I will say, when people ask me what is my greatest regret about my education, it's that I was fortunate enough to have a job offer after my co-op at Mince Levin. And I went back to Mince Levin. I could have gone to Hawaii. <laughs> I could have done a co-op somewhere else. Um, so that is my only regret. Um, but what you know, just kind of thought is that it's not just one thing that you do. With a legal degree, with who you are, you have the ability to do many things. It was that ability to accept change. It was also, I think, a bit in what I've heard today, a little bit of that entrepreneurship that even in my private practice at Vince Levin, they didn't have an international project finance practice. I developed it from having had a bond practice. I had been bond counsel for Northeastern University. Um, so it's taking what I learned, applying it to other things, is I think the biggest gift that Northeastern gave me. And the experiences in co-op and that preparation as a lawyer. So um, as, as a faculty member, I'm so thrilled to be able to have be in conversation with the college president, but also your two areas of interest, education and women's rights, are really central to so much of the debate that we have in the election cycle, right, and in the country today. And so I wanted to start with education, right, because we know a college education has really come under fire uh, in several of our states and being used as a political weapon. Um, and there's this growing sentiment that a college education, and especially a liberal arts education, is really sort of unnecessary, right? I read a study that said nearly half of Americans don't believe that a college education uh, is, quote, very important. So I was just wondering, what do you think led to that, and how can we counter? Well, thank you. And I want to begin by saying, I think we have to respect everyone in what they do and what their choices are, whether they have an education or they don't. But I will say that of education that I see every day on our campus, and I see in Atlanta, and education for so many is an opportunity for social mobility that people would not have. I'm not sure whether people, and it's how many of you in the audience um, are from the South or have spent time in the South? This is great. This is actually a good representation. I will tell you, I have not um, before having this opportunity to go to Agnes Scott. So what I, have, what I have seen in Atlanta and what I should have known, but I didn't, is that 50% of the schools in Atlanta are segregated. Five zero. So when a student is coming to Agnes Scott to receive an education, we are one of the most diverse liberal arts colleges in the country. So for the first time, students are coming to class, living in an environment, having sports with students of a different color for the first time in their life. At the same time, this is an engine of mobility for many of our students. They're in the classroom, they're studying, they're also working. Their families are relying on them. So not only are they looking out for themselves, but they are giving money while they're in school back to their families because they're working in different places. When they graduate, they're looking at jobs. And it's a really interesting thing when we talk about entrepreneurs, and especially entrepreneurs of color, that they may not be able to take that risk, that chance because they have to take the safe job before they can do that, because they need to be able to provide for their families. So what I see every day with respect to education is that it truly is an engine of social mobility. That there are people, not only the students that are relying on it, but that there are families, generations um, that are relying on it. And they see this as a stepping stone. And, and it's proving out that way. And especially with respect to a liberal arts education, 
um, a little arts education prepares, it's again, it's like more Eastern. It prepares you for different things. It gives you the basic skills. And it may be right upon graduation, students are not making as much money as their peers, but what is proven is over time, they will advance. They will make more money over time because it's that basic skill set um, that they receive in the arts education. So you can see I'm a, a bit of a champion <laughs> for education and liberal arts education. Well, we had also talked about global citizenship, right? And the way that uh, college education can prepare students for global citizenship. And Agnes Scott has a really excellent study for our program. I thought was very unique. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that. Absolutely. And again, I'm so proud. And it began before I came to Agnes Scott. One of the things that our faculty, our staff, our trustees, Took a step back six years ago and said, "What? How can we be unique? Um, and how can we best prepare leaders of the future?" And so they developed an experience called the Summit, which focuses on global learning and women's leadership development. And the thing I love, and something I've also been able to add to that experience, um, is experience, experiential learning. So every first year student has a faculty led trip abroad so that it's focused on a topic. So for example, it's not you're going to be a tourist, um, it's peace building. So in class, reading Mandela, Martin Luther King, and then a trip to Northern Ireland to meet with people involved in the peace process. Last year, past post COVID, we were able to send our entire first year class abroad. Um, even better, we were able to get them all back. <laughs> you know about that. We will be sending students to 14 different locations. And the reason I say locations is that also includes the Navajo Nation. Um, so places in the United States, some of our students are DACA students, some of our students can't leave the country. So we've provided you these experiences here in the United States as well. What that has done, is when you walk into a group of, we call them Scotties, Agnes Scott, Scotty Terriers, Scotties, <laughs> um, walk into a group of Scott and with a group of Scotties, all you have to say, whether a first year up to a fourth year, um, a senior, you say, where did you go on journeys? And everybody has an answer. And they can talk about this global experience. So again, think about our diversity. And our diversity is also socioeconomic. So we have, you know, students coming from very wealthy families. We also have 40% of our students are Pell Grant students. But they all have this common experience, this common bond. And throughout their four years, they relate sort of the global experience to what they're doing in the classroom. And the addition in the past couple of years is we focused on professional success for all of our students. So in the second year, every second year student has a leadership experience in Atlanta during that same time. So it could be with a corporation, a nonprofit, an entrepreneurship. But again, it's exposing some of our students who've never been in an office vacation, that have never had an opportunity um, to meet with an entrepreneur, to have that experience. And again, you know, I can relate so much to this because of Northeastern. Um, to have that experience in their second year. We do research in their third year, ACE, etc. So every level, it's liberal arts education combined with experience, but the foundation is set. When we talk about issues, we just hosted a uh, women's global leadership conference last week focused on inclusive leadership. So our speakers came from Rwanda, came from Atlanta, came from California, um, came from the UK. So recognizing these topics that we're focused on, the US doesn't have all the answers. We, we are behind many. And so this global experience is so important to our students and our health as well. Can I go back to politics? Come on, anytime. I want to. Virgin Islands and then Agnes Scott. We're going to march to two. We have phenomenal students from the Virgin Islands. I know you're trying to. I know you're trying to get them to Northeastern. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
if you're, you're as a Mount Holyoke graduate and now president of Agnes Bell College, you're really a believer in women's college and women's education. Could you talk a little bit about that the importance of it for you? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I often say I am who I am because of my education. Mm -hmm. I mean, beginning with Mount Holyoke College as a women's college, a liberal arts college, I really do believe that it was fundamental to my development, um, providing confidence and awareness in a way that I think I would not have achieved in a co-op, in a, in, sorry, a co-ed environment. Um, it was also, you know, very much because of Mount Holyoke, and it was great to have another alum, um, that Northeastern is so attractive, that it's, again, the values that were developed at a women's college, um, the sense of justice um, that was so important coming from a women's college that really led me to Northeastern as well. And I see that every day. And I can tell you that um, back in the day when I went to college, there were 262 women's colleges. Today, there are 32 women's colleges. And you know it is difficult. I mean, the financial support, what you're going to see is that you know whether you know we like it or not, and we know it, I mean, women are not making as much money as men. So to be able to support those colleges, it's very difficult for the financial support with respect to those colleges. So you know it is something that you know we're very proud of of what we've achieved at Agnes Scott, but it's a real struggle um, for many of the women's colleges, especially those who are serving a broader population than the colleges of the Northeast. So clearly you're you know, obviously dedicated to the advancement of women, but we're seeing currently now really an assault on women's rights. So as a champion sort of of women's rights, from your vantage point, you know, how do you see the evolution of women's rights and also what could college students and law students and attorneys do to ensure that we're protecting those women? And thank you so much um, for asking that question. Uh, and it's, it's so important. And I mean, people have to really understand that it is different at this moment than it has been in the past 20 to 30 years. I mean, some of us in this room remember what it was like before Roe versus Wade. A lot of the young people don't. And I remember when you know, I was in the Obama administration and we were developing women in public service and asking some of the women in my office about women in leadership. And the response of the young women was, you know, that was your generation. You know, we don't have to worry about that. Um, you know, it's going to be different today. And I was like, you, you might want to be a little aware. Um, and I'm really happy about where women are today, but it could change in a moment. <clears throat> it has changed in a moment. And I would say those maybe in the Northeast may not really see how significant um, right now, you know, I know there's an election going on here um, in Massachusetts, um, and, uh, and and we have some you know some alums um, <laughs> as part of that election. I mean, clearly, right now in Georgia, we have one of the most important elections of our lifetime. One, it's an election with respect to who's going to control the Senate. The other is a gubernatorial. And right now, there's a heartbeat bill in Georgia. So our students are in a situation, in a college, facing the fact that abortion may not be available to them, health services as women may not be available to them, and anyone who helps them could be found liable for aiding and abetting. It is an absolutely horrendous situation. And again, imagining the population in Georgia, in Alabama, in Tennessee, and having these types of laws that have been already enacted by the state legislature, just waiting for Dobbs to be decided, for them to then be law. So this is, it's so important to women today, to young people, men and women, should be alert to this um, as well. And it is, and what I see with our students is that this is a major way of them. That, you know, that they realize that their rights are now different than they were. 
that they have to be able to act, how much more important the vote is today than ever before. And I'm thrilled to be able to go into Evans Hall, which is our dining hall, seeing the students and getting out the vote campaigns, working in the community. Um, but it is this, we've taken it for granted for a long time. And all, I think all of us have. Um, it's a different day to day. Um, it's a different day for young people. They have a burden that many of us avoided. Um, a burden, and they have so many other things coming out of COVID, having lost time in education. This is not a burden that they should have. And it affects men, but it affects women, and it affects disadvantaged communities even more than anybody else. Thank you. So also, and, you know, as we talked about education, we have an important Supreme Court case coming down on the Food for Fair Education versus Harvard. And as president of a college and an educator, I was just wondering, you know, what you thought about the case. Well, I have to say, again, you know, I am so grateful to be at a college that has such amazing diversity. And it's not an accident. It was something that was extremely intentional. And it is something that has made the campus experience so much better. It has prepared our students and for the future um, in a way that is not the same as if you're not in a diverse environment. What we've seen study after study is that if there are diverse boards, diverse corporations, diverse work environments, then those, those environments succeed at a greater level. It has to start with education. We have to provide an environment where we can encourage diversity in the classroom. We have so much to learn from each other. Uh, we have, but at the same time, I'm going to go back to that opportunity to the underserved, traditional underserved populations. And the fact, again, when we talked about Agnes, Agnes Scott, we talk about the awards of the college. I want to talk about the awards of our students, our diverse students. We received, um, that they just named um, MacArthur Geniuses. And for those of you who might not be aware of it, MacArthur Fellows, the MacArthur Foundation identifies people that they believe are going to be so valuable to our future that they give them $800,000 to do the work. And Agnes got, you know, two Agnes Scott alums. One just received MacArthur Genius this year. One received it last year. Both of these are alums of color. <laughs> this is what is important. Um, and with respect to the cases, um, to be able to allow colleges and universities to provide for a diverse environment. It is better for all of us, better for the students, but it's better for our future. The future of our country. I have just one quick sure. question. Um, the U, when you were working at the U of TDA, I'm sure there are so many things that people are wondering, but in the Obama administration, I'm just wondering, is Obama really as cool as you see? Oh my God. <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. Uh, I, you know, one, I, you know, I had, uh, you know, the honor of being able to travel with the president in Africa and in India, um, just an amazing individual. Uh, incredible leader. And I also have to say, um, subsequently, you know, with respect to the foundation and what he's doing with young people um, and continuing to encourage young people. And uh, I will say during COVID, I had to, I drove from Georgia to DC and back again, listening to his book, because it takes all the way from Georgia to <laughs> and back again. Um, but I, I still use his last. I mean, listening to that book, then now being a college president, I find myself going back to some of the things he said. Um, so he's incredibly cool, um, incredibly smart, um, and inspirational. As are you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
You can see why we is a favorite and has been a women in the law keynote and a keynote for a DC alumni event that we've had it's terrific, which is so pleased you could get away from her presidential duties to be with us today. Thank you, Margaret. You did a terrific job. Next up, we have Tom Galantano of 1987. Um, interviewed by Professor Jan Danielson. Tom um, is a partner at Con Cabinet and a former managing partner there. And we look forward to some nail energy. <laughs> okay. Wow. It's really, I, every time this happens, it's such a thrill to hear across time and space, but both the connectedness of the Eastern alums and values, but also the amazing things that they're engaged in doing in the world. Um, it it's, makes you want to get up and be here and teach every single day. Um, so I have the honor of, uh, of talking with Tom Galatano, who, it's interesting, I, as I think back to our conversation and anticipation of this, one thing that really came through um, and I kept resonating in my head was you really talked with passion about your career as a trial lawyer. And I'm, I want to know, I mean, and we've heard from several people how challenging it is to maintain that kind of energy, that kind of passion, how exhausting it is. I want to know, you know, where did that first spark come from? And, and how have you kept that passion all the way through to now? Well, uh, first off, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to look out and see. Uh, 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 great friends from all the years. Um, you know, uh, I'd say I, I still have a passion for trial law. I don't try nearly as many cases as I used to, uh, mm -hmm. but um, I, I can definitely attribute my passion for being a trial lawyer to the co-op experience. Uh, my second co-op, I clerked for uh, uh, Judge Heller Zobel uh, in Middlesex Superior Court. Uh, for those of you who know Judge Heller Zobel, um, he was forced to be reckoned with. Um, I got the opportunity to sit right in front of his bench to watch him uh, use his hand to shoo uh, uh, lawyers away who had the temerity to put their elbow on the bench. It's <laughs> his bench. Finally got a small potted plant to make sure no one put the elbow there. Um, but uh, I, I you know, had three months of, of being immersed in watching some incredible trials. Um, that led to, you know, as that co-op was wrapping up, he said, you know, you really need to get a federal court clerkship upon graduating from uh, law school. So he, you know, gave my name to a few of his friends in the federal district court. I interviewed there. I got a job with uh, uh, Judge Walter J. Skinner, where I had the privilege of watching a year's worth of trials. Uh, the uh, uh, the sanctions portion of the Woburn Cossack tort trial uh, took place that year, uh, watching Jan Schlickman and Jerry Basher go at it. Uh, King Arthur's Motel Massacre civil trial was that year. That was a rogues gallery of lawyers. No, no offense meant <laughs> rogues or lawyers. Um, and that, you know, that just ignited a passion to be a trial lawyer. And I had the good fortune of uh, getting out and starting my first uh, three and a half years for Hill and Barlow, which had some phenomenal trial lawyers. And, um, but after not for three and a half years, I, I, the closest I got to trial was fourth chair, uh, which is really a back bench. Uh, fourth chair at a trial before Judge David Mazzoni. Uh, first chair, it's Bob Muller. Um, anyway, uh, I went to my, you know, going back to Judge Skinner, asked him, uh, you know, I, I, I want to be a trial lawyer. Where do I need to go? He steered me in the direction of Con Cavanaugh, which at that time was, you know, eight lawyers deep, all mostly trial lawyers. And within two months of joining Con Cavanaugh, I tried my first case. Mm -hmm. And it's been lots of trials ever since. It's fabulous. And, and so, I mean, 
a lot of times, at least in, at least in, in the popular imagination, the, uh, the fantasy of being a trial lawyer is somehow associated with the criminal trial. You know the the, the Perry Masons, the you know whatever. But you you spent your career um, trying employment cases and and also cases involving lawyers often. And so say something about about that experience. Uh, you know, so my practice at this point is split. Mostly it's employment law, but um, it's been a privilege really to to devote significant part of my practice to representing lawyers. Uh, my firm has had a long history of uh, representing attorneys, uh, both in malpractice matters, uh, but also in disciplinary matters before the board of our offices. Uh, and uh, those, are, those are tough cases. Uh, you know, the lawyer whose uh, her, her or his uh, license is on the line, you're talking about someone's livelihood, you're talking about somebody's identity. Um, and um, those, are, those are often uh, some of the most challenging cases. Mm. Um, and bar counsel is in this state, at least in my experience, bar counsel, they're, they're very keen. Mm. <laughs> and, and they tend not to, not to bring cases until, unless they think um, they've got a fairly tight case. Mm -hmm. So, um, and on the employment side, you know, my practice over the years has morphed. I, I, I tried a lot of cases when I was younger. These days, my employment practice really consists of counseling, uh, mainly uh, trying to keep employers uh, out of harm's way, uh, counseling executives in connection with their comings and goings, some, some job to job. Mm -hmm. So the employment practice, of course, over the past two and a half years, uh, the employment practice for anybody who's an employment lawyer. How many employment lawyers are there? Just curious. You know, I'm sure you all agree. There's, there's been a lot of advising on COVID <laughs> on, you know, how to navigate COVID, how to navigate a uh, vaccine mandate, how to ma uh, navigate uh, medical exemption, religious exemptions. That has been uh, a real challenge, um, but also a privilege to be able to help people do that. One thing that you, um, that you, you told me that, that kept you really engaged with, with the employment practice, the employment side of your practice, employment law side, was the idea of helping employers to be better employers. Can you talk a little bit about some examples of how that, um, how that comes through and how you're able to do that through your, through your counseling? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, uh, years ago, uh, one of the firm's business development directors you know, told us all we had to come up with an elevator speech. And I thought long and hard about that, and, and the elevator pitch I gave uh, was uh, cleaning up the workplace one employer at a time. Uh, you know, you can do a lot as an attorney to help your clients uh, be better at what they do. Uh, and employment law uh, is a rich field for that. Um, uh, when, a, when a client comes to me for the first time, and I'm handling the employment matter for them, uh, there's almost always an audit that takes place. You do an audit of their employment practices. You do an audit, audit of their you know, everything, from soup to nuts. And um, you know, more often than not, you'll identify uh, challenges that they have, um, problems they've had with uh, recruiting, problems they've had with retention, problems they've had with managing their workforce. And uh, that's the counseling part of what employment lawyers do. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I have found that most employers are actually very open. It's, it's the rare employer who says, thanks, we don't need your help. We've got this. Mm -hmm. I think most, well, at least in my experience, many employers recognize uh, that lawyers can actually fill a very important role in helping guide them uh, to, to be better employers in terms of how they manage their workforce and activity. That's great. I mean, it, it's interesting because, because on the one hand, because one of the things that seems nice about your practice is, is you are able to bridge the courtroom and this kind of, you know, real hands-on and experience-based counseling. Um, can you talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, your time at Northeastern? What 
I know that you you told me that it was an exciting time to be here in the, in, uh, in the mid '80s, and I'm just I just just say a little bit about about why and what what you found about the environment that was special. Well, that's a big question. Uh, what did I find in study? Then? Well, you know, uh, I forget whether it was my first year or second year. I'm going to look out my classmates here to help you remember this. Um, uh, I know there are a number of faculty openings, and I, I can't say because I wasn't here before. I got here in 84, but I, I can't say whether uh, the administration at the time was open to the idea of student input on hiring faculty, but I have a very fond memory of the process uh, that took place to identify uh, new, new uh, hires, uh, new potential professors. And uh, I, I remember in particular, uh, a young uh, candidate named David Hall, uh, <laughs> who uh, came on site and gave a lecture. And the impression he made was so positive and so overwhelming that the students en masse uh, uh, made a point of saying to the administration, we don't, we don't care what you do about the others, but if you don't make an offer to David Hall, <laughs> there's something wrong with the process. Uh, and, and he was, of course, uh, made an offer and, and the rest, as they say, is, is history. Yes. Um, so one of the things that's been interesting about the stories this morning is, is really um, how many of our alums have this complicated and not always direct path, but a path that might, that's really brings them into positions of leadership. And I know for yourself, I mean, you you actually wound up, you said you, man, you were a managing partner of your firm for nine years. Um, and you also do a, a fair amount of leadership in the community. So can you talk a little bit about Northeastern lawyering and leadership and how those things may connect you. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to make the direct connection to Northeastern there, but um, uh, you know, becoming managing part of the firm was uh, uh, both a privilege and a challenge. Uh, it was a first generation law firm, uh, and uh, there was a clear interest in there being more than just one generation. And so, you know, through nine years of leading the firm. We created a, a, a first a succession transition plan. We uh, created the first long term strategic plan. Um, and you know, those things just grew out of, frankly, my employment practice as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. A lot of employment law, uh, well, some employment law, at least the council side involves counseling your clients through successions and transitions, mm -hmm. uh, leadership succession. Um, as far as things out, out in the community, uh, you know, I've served on a number of different nonprofit boards. Uh, that, in part, uh, uh, has, has developed as a result of my client work. Mm -hmm. uh, hard to say. I, I don't know that I can necessarily draw a line from that back to Northeastern, but. Uh, no, 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 but I guess it's just interesting because um, obviously as people grow in their careers, they mature in that, in, in, but, but it's what's been interesting on these from this morning is how many people have grown into positions of, of, of leadership and trying to bring the kinds of values that I think everyone's spoken about with respect to Northeastern into those experiences, whether on the federal bench or Virgin Islands, whatever, and um, and so just it just was striking to see that you too, uh, out of your practice, became a really important leader, not just in your firm, but also in your communities. Yeah, I, I don't know uh, how many people here have had an opportunity to serve on the board of nonprofits, but it's 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 been one of my sincere privileges to be able to give back that way. Um, uh, I uh, served for about eight years on the board of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra here in Boston. I served for six years as a trustee of the Boston Bar Foundation. Um, one of my other passions is for uh, community mental health. 
Um, I, had, I had earlier in my career the opportunity to represent some community health uh, centers, programs, and uh, uh, that led to uh, joining the board of Brookline uh, Center for Community Mental Health, which is one of the nation's oldest community mental health centers. So, thank you. That's it. Thanks so much for joining us today. Enjoy your Thank you, Todd. It's good to see that. See, we have two musical, musically inclined music. That's the passion of your. Thank you, Dan. Always a pleasure. Next up, we have Kiana Gibbons, who is our federal public defender for the District of Massachusetts to Hampshire and Rhode Island. She's a superstar and one fun to listen to. And we have a newer professor, Stevie Lady, 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 who was enthusiastically supportive about having her participate this morning. So great to have you both. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Such great energy in the room. What does it feel to be back? It's really us. Oh, it feels great. I do think in these changeovers, we need walk on songs. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, as a federal public defender and also a Balsa member, I felt like I need to. As you have a, a song in Yeah, I do. Right. As a criminal defense attorney, I wanted to have Nas played. <laughs> I free all my sons. <laughs> See, DEI is not working, but I know that. And you don't think of <laughs> But I know John Mellon here, and you know that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, I just say that to. As a trial attorney, you know, this is the time when we make the jury stand up because they've been sitting for a long time. And so, <laughs> so you always need a little something to get the energy back up. I think that's a good tip for so next year. Walk people up. Stand up. <laughs> you can stretch, you can stand even while I'm talking. Um, so we're so pleased to have you, and I'm looking forward to hearing about your work as a federal public defender. But I want to kind of take you back, and I want to hear about your motivations for choosing Northeastern and, and the professional law. Um, so for me, I wanted to come to Northeastern um, hands down because of the co-op program. I mean, at the time, that was the thing that spoke to me, stood out to me, and there overt intentional commitment to public interest. Um, but the reason why I really wanted to become a lawyer was because I had gotten a social work specialty in undergrad, and I worked under this fantastic ER MSW, who was our professor, and sort of um, led us through undergrad. And then I went to work for DSHS, and in, I'm from Seattle, Washington. At that time in Seattle, there was a young girl who um, died in foster care, right? And it actually, they thought that it was a murder. Um, and so I, we were investigating sort of this, we didn't know what, if it was a homicide or not. We write this big, long report, we go to court and we hand this, I mean, it was maybe 300 pages from just the social work vantage point to this lawyer in superior court. And she takes it, she made me read like three headings that I had spent my entire, like half of my school year working on. And I said, oh no, I gotta be the person that tells the story. Not the person that likes the story. <laughs> so that's how I decided that I really wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be up there talking directly to the judge and telling the story. And getting credit for your work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've been hearing so much about professors that mean things to people from their time here at Northeastern. And I know you had mentioned Susan Mays Rothstein, who founded the program that I now teach in, um, Jim Rowan. He went on to work with um, Professor Ogletree in Harvard. So can you just talk a little bit about what those relationships meant to you and mentorship in general along the way? Yeah, I mean, those relationships meant everything. Uh, we've heard a lot of this sort of, um, Northeastern Mount Rushmore, Dan Velvet. I mean, go across space and time. Isn't it funny that name? He taught forever. <laughs> um, but I would add to that group um, my heroes were people like Pamela Bridgewater and Hope Lewis, um, David Hall, of course. Uh, Susan Mays Rossi um, and Jim Rowan. And I will divert and tell a story about the late, great 
you know, Pamela Bridgewater Torre, because I think it speaks to why many of us came to Northeastern. It's that thing we hear this whole morning, which is that flexibility of thinking, those mavericks. And I think our professors demonstrated that. And I remember sitting in first year property law with Pamela Bridgewater, and she's talking about all being property. And then she, at the end of the course, she says, and I hope I'll see you all in secure transactions, which you know, you don't have to take. <laughs> and she, and she had to speak into what she taught. And she, she said with so much passion, because you know, secure transactions is the people's law. Yeah? And if you would always say, yeah, a question is if you have to agree with it. And I think that is the demonstration of the education we got from Northeastern was these mavericks, innovators, the way we thought about the law and the way we were taught about the law was not standard. And um, so I love that. And I just want to tell that story about her because she was one of my great mentors. I think everyone needs to know if you actually did take secure transactions. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> what type of mentee would I be if I, I wanted everything to do with Pamela Lynn Butter. She was amazing. Can you talk a little bit about Yes, um, so I will say, um, and to the audience at home too, I wasn't a star student at Northeastern. Um, I was kind of mosing along. I, I will say one of my heroes also was um, uh, Debbie Ramirez. And also in our first year, she made us do ride-alongs with the officers, right? And she taught me, um, I'm gonna talk about Professor Ogletree, but it's sort of a bridge to it, which is, I was in first year um, in criminal procedure and she started giving the statistics about um, foster kids are who was ending up at the time we were having a big conversation. That was who was in our criminal justice system, especially our juvenile justice. And the way the booty that Northeastern does to you is that I took away from those statistics that I needed to go to my grad school home of roommates and become a foster parent. So while I was in law school, I became a foster parent. Um, in my first year with a bunch of other crazy wild grad students, and I don't know why they gave us kids. As a mom now, I'm like, oh, you make like 20 year old runaways? Okay. Um, and, but I got that sort of thinking, that flexibility, um, the passion, right, from people like Debbie Ramirez. And I remember as I was going through the training is when I really started to discover and read about uh, Professor Ogletree. He was a local, is a local hero, giant of our time. I always say, you can fight me if you want to, but he's one of the best minds of our century. Um, and I have a great love for him. His mentorship meant everything to me. Um, I think as a young lawyer, uh, in when I was 20 and I graduated from law school, like most 20 year olds who graduated from law school, I knew everything. <laughs> um, and so I remember walking across, you know, I had the privilege of being in this environment right out of law school and Ogletree's thing was always, um, everybody should do a post-grad period after law school and he believed it should be like medical school or residence. And so I was in this environment where I was with an innovative thinker, who was thinking about the future, but also always turning behind and honoring our heroes and the history. He was in great love of history. And I really folded that into my practice when I argue to judges, um, I often argue the history behind the problems that we're talking about. And I got that um, from Ogletree. And I, you know, it just gave me an opportunity to be at the right time, luckily, at you know, the right place at the right time because you know, I spent the summer, you know, running lunch to John Hope Franklin, you know, while he was writing his memoir, right? Um, Lonnie Gournier, all of these greats were people that I was, had the privilege to serve and be around and listen to the dialogue before they come out and speak. Um, and that was an education that I live on to this day, quite frankly. I love your story about taking in a foster student. I think that really embodies Northeastern law students just wanting to do things and be part of change and just immediate action. So I'm going to tell all my 1Ls that you not only juggled 1L year, but you also fostered a child. So, <laughs> it's not maybe not a good student. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 
like driving and gun hunting can add after stopping at a school where someone was may or may not going to be kicked out. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. I'm sure it really contributed to your parenting now. Though. I'm serious. Oh, yeah. But my, my kids now, I, I can't also account for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so not only did you have some great mentors, but you got on to kind of pay it forward. You do a lot of mentoring, you do teaching, a lot within criminal defense broadly, but the intersection of um, criminal law and technology. And so can you just talk about what you pass on to up and coming lawyers in terms of how they can balance their passion for work with family, with self, with everything else that you have to yeah, and I think we see, we've seen it and we've heard it today, which is bring your full self to your practice, right? Um, whatever it is, whatever your focus is. Um, I often tell students that um, for me, you know, um, Justice Ginsburg is sort of famous for saying like, um, dissent speak to the future, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like as a federal criminal defense attorney, we are the, the centers of the criminal justice uh, system. And we have to always be looking to the future. We're the storytellers of our time. So we have to always constantly be looking forward. What's ahead? What's coming down the pipe? And for me, that's how I landed at that intersection pretty early on of um, digital technology and criminal law. Because um, as a federal criminal defense attorney, you know that DOJ is always about 15 years ahead of us with the tech. By the time we see it in our cases, um, it's too late. And so I encourage people, I talk a lot about what we talk about now. I mean, CSIPs, which is, you know, like the, um, it's the crime and intellectual property section of DOJ. They were talking about biometrics, facial recognition, license plate readers, right, all the things long before. And so um, I, I am always trying to think about a lawyer who is dissenting forward and bending toward the future. What's coming? How do we level the playing field? What areas of the law that we already know? That's why I like talking about digital tech is if you take all the tech out of it, we know Fourth Amendment law. And that's really what it all boils down to. It is just filtering Fourth Amendment law through the tech. And you can't be afraid of it because we, and the law hasn't quite frankly caught up to it. So we can actually win these. Um, and so that's that's one of my obsessions. I will talk about it. I know there's a card coming up behind my head. <laughs> we still have time. Um, I'd love to hear about, you just recently started as the federal defender for Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. What does that day-to-day -day look like? And what do you hope to accomplish in that space? It's a big question. We don't have the time. <laughs> um, I am 166 days into being uh, the federal defender for Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. It's a big job. Um, I try to say simply, my focus has shifted from my love and passion for my clients and taking care of people, which the people in our system is always my North Star. Um, and everything that I do, I'm trying to say, how does this advance the mission of representing um, effectively people who can't afford to have a work? Um, but now my focus shifts to managing people. I need to go back to, I don't know, law school, undergrad, something, and get my PhD in managing people because that's what I do, but I'm devoted to it because if I manage my people well, much like um, Adrian was saying, then they can do our mission. And really that's what it shifted. So it's not sexy, it's not the trial stuff. It is, you know, data, it's approving leads, it's um, looking at reasonable accommodations and making sure that we make adjustments so that people can do their work. It's figuring out what the hell, um, this hybrid <laughs> telework system looks like in a fair way. Um, and we're in the people business, right? So I spent a lot of time thinking, well, what does a telework trial criminal defense attorney look like when all the magic happens with the people that we represent and the energy and the synergy and trying to balance that? I feel strongly that we are in the people business. And I say all the time, you've got to be present to win. And Zoom uh, is much of a techie, right? Yeah. 
I'm not for the Zoom connection. It's different than when I show up on a Saturday morning all across the country while we sit here. There's hardworking state and federal defense attorneys sitting with a person in a prison, a jail, a county jail. They've driven two hours, two and a half hours to do it. And when we do that, our people that we represent and the stories we need to tell, we capture that information and they know that we care. And that's really important. I love your continual emphasis and return to storytelling. It's really powerful. It really speaks to who you are. It does. And I get that directly from Ogletree. Don't yell yeah. at me. He used to always talk about the griot, if you don't know what that is, sort of like African traditional storyteller. And he would always say, we are the storytellers of our time. And my career says that, right? Um, I was in Northeastern on co-op during 9-11. And I had to tell stories. Um, at the law firm that I was in, of people who were impacted by that, right? Um, I have represented January Sixers. That's a different type of story of our time, right? <laughs> um, so I think we get to be present as history is unfolding and sort of tell, um, if you remember anything about NPR and Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. Oh. <laughs> um, in terms of the story and the story of criminal justice, and maybe the future story, you've written a lot about making changes in the system as a player in the system. And I think that's something that resonates with so many Northeastern graduates. That's why they come here. They want to make changes to that system or even tear that system down. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about how you balance changing the system while you're working within that system? It goes all the way back to becoming a foster parent, right? Like I couldn't live with those statistics being out there without doing something. Um, and I think I'm like that. I've been a foster parent now, every state that I've lived in on my journey. Um, and, you know, I, I just feel like you have to do something else that is feeding you besides this type of work that can make you, quite frankly, let's be honest, um, burnt out, bitter, maybe mentally ill, and you probably drink too much, okay? So you have to make sure you find something else that is feeding you, whatever that is, whatever that looks like for you. For me, it's getting out, it's teaching, it's talking to young people, it's talking to students, um, it's serving, it's playing with my kids. I, I, mean, I have little kids, they're eight and six, and quite frankly, they don't care. Um, if I was like having to write a writ of someone who would, is facing the death penalty when I come home, they're like, um, so what about Pinocchio? You know, <laughs> there's a new action figure Pinocchio put me out on TV. What about that? And I'm like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think you have to just search and find that thing that feeds you. And I've always um, known that and held strongly to it because I love this work if you can't tell. Oh, yeah. I feel passionate about it and I'm glad that 20 years in, I wake up and do something when my alarm goes off that I still love. That is a, a privilege. Mm -hmm. a, a wonderful place to be in your career. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you, we have so many great alums here. Do you ever out in the wild get to encounter Northeastern alums or work with alums? And what does that look like? All the time, and I obsess. Like right now, I just met this past week with Quain Lee, and I was just like, "Give me all the co-op students." Yeah, now that I'm back, yeah. bring them all to me. And then I was like, "And then tell your friends because I want to build this empire of a multidisciplinary office, right? That it's not just about the lawyers; it's about the social workers, it's about the nurses, it's about mental health, it's about education." Um, so. Um, I do that, like I always am looking for co-ops. When I was in Seattle, I encouraged them to get co-ops. Um, when I'm out in the world and I encounter Northeastern, we always laugh because everyone else is like, oh, oh law school is so terrible. <laughs> I have so much law school trauma. <laughs> Northeastern person were like, that was so good. We're <laughs> like the happiest law students in the world. So that's another sort of thing that I'm <laughs> well, we will end on a note of storytelling and where you see you know, your future career, your story going, um, where you hope to end up someday. This is a what we scripted. This is a, this is an <laughs> extra. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right on the spot. Um, you know.
you know, I really love what I'm doing and I hope that I can figure out, everyone's talking about the future of work, but I think the future of work for, and within the criminal justice system at a federal level um, looks different um, and really hard answers. You do want to take your ball and go home, you know, I often daydream about being an abolitionist, right? Or, uh, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm in a system that I can't really do that. Um, so for me, I think a lot about what the future of a vibrant, modern, federal criminal practice looks like. And I think it is, in Boston, I think we're known for being like the best writers and it's sort of a boutique um, up on a hill. I don't want that. I want to bring it down to the storefront. I want to open the doors. The courthouse belongs to the people and our office belongs to the people. Um, the community. So we've got to find environments in which we can bring the community in um, to serve the people that we represent. So I think somewhere in there is what it looks like. I, I fantasize about a lab of all of these different professions, almost like incubator, think tank type of environment. But then we go out in court and we raise hell because of all of this information and energy that we have. Such a great note to, to end on. Thank you so much. For ah. Couple of dynamos. Very fun. So we're on our final conversation of the morning. One of our pairings uh, had to um, had an illness and couldn't make it. So we're on our final pairing, which is Gautam Jagannath, who's visiting from California, his class of 2012. He's the executive director of a social justice collaborative, so he's right up our alley. He's going to be interviewed by uh, alumni board president, former alumni board president, Stephanie Swanson, class of 2012 as well. And I look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Bob. So I want to thank everybody for sticking with us and, you know, best for last, obviously. So, um, you know, you're in for a treat. Um, I am obviously the only non-professor interviewer today. So no fact pattern. I'm not going to hide the ball. There's no final exam after this. Um, I also think we have the privilege, and this is U.S. Virgin Islands in Florida and Atlanta, notwithstanding, of having the alum interviewee from the furthest location for no, California, right? right? So I know that you know, I looked it up to be sure. You <laughs> gave me pause, but you know, I think you like 1,500 miles. We got 3,000. Um, yep. And we are also the youngest uh, class. Uh, so we're going to be in the here. Sorry, plus 2017, you didn't make the cut. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and we have a lot of incredible alums. Some are here, some aren't. One of them, obviously, is Gautam, um, and I think you're going to really enjoy what uh, what he's been up to. So why don't you set the table for us? Tell us a little bit about uh, the Social Justice Collaborative, how it came to be, and what you're up to with these days. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's nice to be back here and um, fond memories of doing civil procedure in this room and getting picked on. Um, <laughs> By Professor Wu? Right? Professor yeah. Wu, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was great. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was a reluctant student. I had been a high school teacher um, for several years in inner city Oakland, um, Moore Law School. And my wife, Emily, and I, and here, she'll be back in a moment. Um, we, we both kind of went to law school for different reasons, relatedly, to, you know, um, basically to fight injustices that we had seen in our professions in different ways. And, um, you know, I had spent so much of my time as a teacher, basically helping kids out with family legal issues. And I was like, you know what? Um, I need to kind of change the direction of my career. So, um, you know, I was a reluctant student. I didn't want to go back to sort of like bookish stuff. Um, and I was like, you know, I needed to be in a progressive milieu. And, you know, we both knew Northeastern was the right place to go to. And um, so it turns out the experience I like, was probably the best experience ever. Um, I really thought that I wanted to do, um, you know, a variety of different things. And then I got experience that, and I realized, you know what, I need to like own what I'm thinking because I got to try these things out and you know, it turns out my interests were different. Um, so, you know, we started SJC in 2012 when we graduated. Um, and we're a nonprofit with deportation defense. We're actually, the, we were at, in 2012 the first um, immigration focused nonprofit to deal with trial lawyer work. And for those of you who don't know about deportation, 
um, it's basically one of the most high stakes thing that happens outside of criminal law. And, um, you know, folks were scared to do it in a nonprofit setting. Um, it is very high stress work. It is very high stakes. It's one of the only areas of law where you can basically get a death sentence and not have a rule of evidence applied in your case. Um, and we we're like, this, this has to be done for people who can't afford a lawyer. And um, it was pretty surprising uh, how much resistance there was when we got started in 2012. People thought it wouldn't work. People thought, you know what? I mean, at that time, the job market was really bad for new grads. And they were like, you know what? We're just not going to get work. And um, people were just lining up at the door to get services because the, there was just no, no one doing this work. Um, and um, yeah, it was, you know, at this point, we're celebrating 10 years at SJC and um, you know, we're a team of close to 50 now. Um, how we, many did you start with? We, it was just, it was just Emily and me. We started in 2012. <laughs> um, and I remember we like shared one chair. So one of us was standing the phone. And um, yeah, we, we've, we've celebrated 1,500 trials that have been successful in my yeah, and um, just really like surprising how um, a lot of people don't think that administrative law can basically operate in that way. But you know, these really are trials. I think a lot of people think that they go to this administrative law area and it's like 20 minutes, but it's not. It's it's a several day bench trial. So it sounds like you have a lot to be proud about, to say the least. But what um, sticks out in your mind as one of the, the proudest moments or proudest experiences or victory? in your role? I think, um, you know, I'm thinking about Northeastern, especially in terms of the victory. I think like the number of interns that we've brought through our program, co-op students included, um, it's really been great to mentor. We have over 50 interns who come through our um, organization every year. And I think like seeing, you know, people from all walks of life who have an interest in doing uh, racial justice work. It's, it's been really great to see that. Um, and, and tell us a little bit more about the refugee work that you do in California. Yeah, so most of our work is refugee work. Um, so 80% of our clients are folks who are fleeing their country because they can't be here, they're being persecuted. And if they were to go back, they most likely would be tortured or killed. Um, the vast majority for most of our time have been Central American refugees and, and kids, um, especially unaccompanied minors, folks who have to leave their home. And, you know, these kids are 10, 11, 12 years old, by and large, who have to make their way through on a train and uh, come to the border and get apprehended and uh, sit in a detention center for weeks, sometimes months, before they even have an opportunity to talk to them. Um, and, um, you know, now, of course, the, the refugee profile has changed so much with changing civil strife all over the world. We see Afghani clients, a lot of Ukrainian clients, um, Venezuelans, um, the civil strife in Venezuela has changed quite a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we've seen a bit of a change between the last presidential administration, this one, to, you know, to say the least. Um, you know, what has the impact been in the Trump administration versus the Biden administration? You know, what, what do you see that's different, what's the same, and you know, yeah. how has that work been? Yeah, it's really night and day because um, immigration is, is agency law. And so whoever's in power at the White House can affect um, policy in a huge way and, and how the law is applied. And um, of course, you know, Trump did a huge number on immigration, and we're still feeling the effects of that today. Thankfully, some of the applications of the procedures have changed, but, um, you know, for example, refugees were able to get work authorization within about six months of their arrival here, and that's turned into a year. So we've got families who are having, who are basically forced to work without a work permit, um, and with no other access to any sort of funding if they can work. Um, and that's largely due to these changes that, that happened at the executive level. Um, and so slowly it's getting unwound, but um, I think the effects are, are detrimental and they last beyond the administration. And I think that's what's so important about having a kind of a consistency of services. Like when we started SJC, my view was like, we wanted to be the immigration public defender. And we're kind of that 
in a way in, in Northern and Central California. We did a study and we represent about 3% of all immigrants who are going through the removal process um, in the San Francisco Immigration Court. And um, yeah, I think that you just can't predict the future and um, whoever's in power can, can make such a drastic change in the town of Um Circling back to Northeastern, you know, you talked a little bit about what we were thinking before coming to law school that changed a little bit. How did how did Newsol impact your career path and, and your thinking? Yeah, I think it was really great to be in a room with people who thought like me. Um, and I think that was really critical. Um, so many of the the, the law clerks who come by um, at FKC tell me about how challenging it is to not only have experienced um, racism and ignorance outside the classroom, but then for that to get reinforced in the classroom uh, at other law schools. And I felt like that didn't really happen here at Northeastern. I thought that was such a critical part of development because when you're going through and you want to do transformative work, if you don't have that um, access to openness, it will really kind of crack down on your ability to make it. And was there a class or professor that, that really sort of made a difference for you in the trajectory mm -hmm. of your career took? So many. Um, I remember uh, Lucy Williams' set course was really important for me. Uh, Judge Florentine's evidence was great. I mean, I still spent a lot of time using a lot of the, the jokes that he had in his evidence class, <laughs> inventing other, other clerks at SJC. Um, yeah, I think Hope Lewis, who I was looking for him for a long time. Thank you for that. Can you, can you give us a Jeff Warren scene that I hope And what about co ops? Did those, did those affect the direction too? Can you remember all the larger co ops? Yeah, I really I did. yeah, I did two public defender co ops. Yeah. Yeah, that's really what I'd be very interested in. And then um, I did two in immigration. Um, and yeah, I got to do it in different kinds of locations. Right. And what um, what other projects are you working on? Are they related or unrelated? Yeah, um, I just became a certified mediator. Uh, and I really, I really got interested in alternate dispute resolution because in immigration, there's absolutely no incentive to settle a case. The government it just wants to prosecute everything to the end. Um, and unlike criminal law, we have no fee agreements. So a case really should not end outside of a trial setting. Um, and um, I think, you know, the interesting thing about mediation is you get over 85% of a success rate in terms of resolution and both parties walk away happy. Um, and so it's, it's been really interesting. To yeah. um, what, um, what would you say your mission statement is? What do you, you know, what, do you, what are the words you live by? Oh, keep striving to do the best all the time, whatever that is for you, I think. <clears throat> and do you have um, a favorite Newsol memory or moment? And, you know, keeping in mind your wife went to law school with you, so. Yeah. You know. <laughs> 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 Every moment you with her is the answer that sure, you want to Sure, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, I think just like hanging out downstairs with yep. the doctors, yep. just like talking to people and just, just generally like hanging out there. I feel like everybody comes out down there. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't think everyone had Doctor Commons, right? So we're lucky. We're one of the lucky. I mean, this was like a new building when we started. Yeah, right? yeah. Really, really new. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and what about um, what about a favorite book or what are you currently reading? Anything you want to suggest to, to our friends here? Gosh, I know I've been reading much recently. <laughs> become a new dad, um, so like you know, I you know barely get four hours of sleep at night and read. Um, but I do read Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. <laughs> <laughs> My son is obsessed with it. He'll point to it and he has to read it. Right? He'll break out. <laughs> I've got a couple other recommendations for you. I've got a three year old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, my last question for you, and I think it's an important one, is, you know, obviously you do a lot of great work. There's more work to do. You're, it's your 10 year anniversary. I'm sure there's a lot of support that you receive, but more could be, uh, you know, would be greatly appreciated. So, you know, if all any of the members of the audience, um, you know, want to get involved or, or want to support you in the work that you and your wife do, um, how, would they, how would they do that? 
Yeah, I mean, outside of donations, if you've got any connections to people um, at a firm or in-house counsel, yeah. we do a number of pro bono clinics every year. We actually do about 20 pro bono clinics a year. And with COVID and the difficulty of being in person, we've become quite good at doing it the most. So you're based in California and you're in Boston, you're in New York, it doesn't matter. We can still host you and you can have a pro bono experience um, working with our clients. So I'd encourage you to reach out to me and um, do that. That's great. So and the email address is, I have it right here, but you want to give it to me? Yeah, it's my first name, which is Gautam, G-A-U-T-A-M, at socialjusticecollaborative.org. Perfect. And the website is socialjusticecollaborative.org. So um, thank you so much, Gautam. This was a lot of fun.